To the Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society, a podcast dedicated to suspense, crime, and horror stories from the golden age of radio. I'm Eric. I'm Tim. And I'm Joshua. We love mysterious old-time radio stories, but do they stand the test of time? That's what we're here to find out. Today we kick off a four-part series featuring special guest appearances by our mysterious patrons. Our first guest is David. Hello! David is a generous supporter of the Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society, and as a thank you, we've invited him to join us for a discussion of an episode of his choosing. David, what are we listening to today? Brave New World from CBS Radio Workshop, part one and part two. Uh, both parts? Are you serious? He gives us money, remember? In 1936, CBS Radio debuted a new series called Columbia Workshop. The network envisioned the workshop as an incubator for radio talent, a a venue where artists could experiment with new ideas and techniques without the creative and budgetary restrictions of a sponsor. In 1956, the network revived Columbia Workshop as CBS Radio Workshop. This new version of the acclaimed series was designed to be just as innovative as the original. By the mid-1950s, television had all but replaced radio as the country's dominant form of entertainment. The network hoped CBS Radio Workshop could lure discerning Americans back to the radio with a promise of mature and innovative content. To that end, CBS chose to open the series with a two-part adaptation of Aldous Huxley's 1931 novel, Brave New World. CBS spared no expense. Original music for the production was composed and conducted by Bernard Herrmann. Aldous Huxley introduced and narrated both parts of the adaptation, and the cast included such well-respected radio talent as Joseph Kearns, Herb Butterfield, Parley Bear, Lorene Tuttle, Jack Christian, and William Conrad, to name just a few. CBS Radio Workshop was well-received by listeners and critics alike, but despite the network's best efforts, they could not forestall the demise of dramatic radio. After only a year and a half on the air, CBS Radio Workshop aired its final episode September 22, 1957. It was the network's last attempt at big-budget, high-quality radio programming. The good news is all 86 episodes survive today and can be found online for nerds like us to enjoy and discuss. So now, let's listen to the first two episodes of CBS Radio Workshop, Brave New World Part 1 and... I guess part two. First aired January 27th and February 3rd, 1956. It's late at night and the chill has set in. You're alone, and the only light you see is coming from an antique radio. Listen to the sounds coming from the speaker, listen to the music, and listen to the voices. Ladies and gentlemen, the distinguished author, Mr. Aldous Huxley. Brave New World is a fantastic parable about the dehumanization of human beings. In the negative utopia described in my story, man has been subordinated to his own inventions. Science, technology, social organization, these things have ceased to serve man. They have become his masters. A quarter of a century has passed since the book was published. In that time, Our world has taken so many steps in the wrong direction that if I were writing today, I would date my story not 600 years in the future, but at the most 200. The price of liberty and even of common humanity is eternal vigilance. CBS Radio a division of the Columbia Broadcasting System and its 217 affiliated stations present the premier broadcast of the CBS Radio Workshop, radio's distinguished series dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind. Tonight, 
part one of two half-hour programs devoted to one of the world's most shocking and famous novels. Aldous Huxley's terrifying forecast of the future, Brave New World. We are proud to have Mr. Huxley as narrator for these broadcasts. Original music is composed and conducted by Bernard Herrmann. This is Aldous Huxley, and these are the sounds of the brave new world, of test tube and decanter, of hissing injectors and gurgling blood substitute. The year is AF 632, 632 years after Ford. We are inside the London Hatchery and Conditioning Centre, and this is the fertilising room, an enormous laboratory where the temperature is never allowed to fall below 98.6. And here comes the director of hatcheries and conditioning in person, bringing with him a group Tomorrow, of young students. Tomorrow you will be settling down to serious work. Today I just want to give you a general idea of things. Uh, these are the incubators, and here is the weak supply of over, kept at blood heat. Uh, come along, boys. Now here, we immerse the eggs into a warm bouillon containing free-swimming spermatozoa. Immersion continues until the eggs are all fertilised. Ah, and over here, here is where we bottle the alphas and betas. In short, gentlemen, the perfect process for manufacturing healthy babies. Are there any questions? Uh, sir, uh, will you explain the uh, Bakanovsky process? I'm glad you asked that. Uh, students, take this down. <laughs> Bakanovsky's process. Where in olden times, one egg made one embryo which made one baby. Today, we've improved on all that. Now the egg will bud, will divide, from eight to 96 buds, and every bud will grow into a perfectly formed embryo and every embryo into a mature baby, making 96 human beings grow where only one grew before. Progress. But uh, what advantage is it, sir? Uh, I mean... Uh... Oh, my good boy, can't you see? Where in olden times nature allowed us only to have twins or perhaps triplets or so, today we can create scores, yes, scores of identical individuals. We can manufacture men and women in uniform batches. Think of it. An entire factory staffed with the product of one single egg. 96 identical individuals working 96 identical machines. At last, society really knows where it stands. Remember, it was our Ford who gave us the concept of the assembly line when he was on Earth many centuries ago. And now, boys... We will go up to the bottling room where we shall see how we create each class of society. Alphas, betas, deltas, etc. Come with me. Well, Lenina. Oh, director. Oh, charming, charming. Ah, what are you injecting into our embryos today, my dear? Typhoid antitoxin? Yes, sir. Are you uh, busy this afternoon? Oh, not after five, sir. Good. Suppose we get together then on the roof. That would be fine. I've admired you for some time, then, Nina. I'm looking forward to a closer acquaintance. Thank you, sir. And now, boys, we're off to the bottling room. <gasps> you are a lucky girl. The director of hatcheries and conditioning. Oh, hello, Fanny. Oh, you can trust the director to be the perfect gentleman. I saw him pat you. He wants me. You see? That shows what he stands for. The strictest conventionality. And it's about time you started belonging to someone else, my dear. But I like Henry Foster. We've only been with each other four months. Four months? Well, what would the district world controller say? You know how he disapproves anything intense or long-drawn... And it isn't as though there were anything painful or disagreeable about being with one or two other men besides Henry. After all, everyone belongs to everyone else. You're quite right, Fanny, as usual. Good girl. Uh, Fanny, do you know Bernard Marx? <gasps> Bernard Marx? Well, why not? Bernard's an Alpha Plus. Besides, he asked me to go to New Mexico, to the Savage Reservation with him. But his reputation... They say he doesn't like obstacle golf. Oh, they say, they say. And that he spends most of his time by himself alone. They say somebody made a mistake when he was still in the bottle. 
thought he was a gamma and put alcohol into his blood substitute. That's why he's so stunted. Oh, what nonsense. Oh, very well, Lenina. It's your life, my dear. But I think you're heading for trouble. <laughs> And here we have the bottling room. Little embryos carefully bottled being rocked gently to and fro as they did in olden days when carried by their mothers. <gasps> now, boys, you must learn to distinguish between smut and science. I am going to use that word again. As scientists of tomorrow, you must learn to cope with it. Mother. Oh. <coughs> there, that's better. As a matter of fact, there is an area in our world where humans are still viviparous, still give birth to their children. The Savage Reservation in New Mexico. I uh, visited there once myself many years ago. Dreadful, filthy place. Naturally, civilization has improved on all that. Ah, it is here we control the embryo's growth, each batch carefully regulated to produce the exact class of citizen we desire. And here is our Mr. Henry Foster in charge of bottling. Oh, Henry. Uh, yes, sir. Please explain the process to the students. Oh, delighted, sir. By the way, Henry, before you begin, I made a date with Lenina Crown this afternoon. Oh, really? I'm delighted, sir. I'm sure you'll enjoy belonging to her. Good. Very pneumatic girl. Now, please proceed. This way, gentlemen. <clears throat> here, we advance the process. One by one, the eggs are transferred from their test tubes into these larger decanters and moved along to the labelers, carefully labeled as to heredity, date of fertilization, sex, name, serial number. Gentlemen, there are 88 cubic feet of card index in this room. Now, here is where we actually predestine and condition. Nothing is so unstabilizing to society as unhappy people. We avoid all that by preconditioning our embryos. And now we are entering the heat conditioning room. Hot tunnels alternating with cool tunnels. Exposure to cold is accompanied by exposure to x-rays. By the time these babies are decanted, they have a perfect horror of cold. Thus, they are perfectly prepared to emigrate to the tropics, to be miners and acetate silk spinners and steel workers. And that... That is the secret of happiness and virtue, liking what you have got to do. All conditioning aims at that, making people like their unescapable social destiny. Oh, ten to three, boys. Time to visit the nurseries. And so the director continued on his tour. Meanwhile, in his rooms high above the city, Bernard Marx nervously paced the floor. I'm taking Lenina Crown in New Mexico with me, Helmholtz, to the Savage Reservation. Well, it's about time. What do you mean by that? I'll be frank, Bernard. There's been a lot of talk about your behavior at the College of Emotional Engineering. Of course, I've been defending you, And I'm but... supposed to be grateful? Because you're a successful feelies writer? Because you're tall, well-built, have all the girls you want? Oh, Bernard... <laughs> Now, you know how I feel. I want to write. I mean, seriously, not slogans or feelies. I, I want to write something important. Mm -hmm. now, lately, I've been cutting out my committees and my girls. The director called me in just the other day. Are you in trouble, too? There's a poem I wrote, too emotional, he said. Mm. He gave me the lecture about being an alpha plus, about remembering to behave even as a little infant. I know. I tried to explain to Lenina, but she doesn't understand, or won't understand. All those other men she belongs to, Henry Foster, Benito Hoover, they treat her like, like a side of beef. It's disgusting. It's socially proper. We share and we share alike, remember? But I want her for myself, alone. Bernard, you're my closest friend. Now, you listen to me. You can't win this way. Follow the rules. Play the game. Be happy. <laughs> The nursery was on the fifth floor. The sign over the door said, Neo-Pavlovian Conditioning Room. It was a large, bare room, very bright and sunny, 
Half a dozen nurses, trousered and jacketed in the regulation white viscose linen uniform, were engaged in setting out bowls of roses in a long row across the floor. The nurses stiffened to attention as the director of hatcheries and conditioning came in, followed by his students. Set out the books. In silence, the nurses obeyed his command. Between the rose bowls, the books were duly set out. Now bring in the children. They hurried out of the room and returned in a moment, each pushing a kind of tall, dumb waiter, laden on all its four wire-knitted shelves with eight-month-old babies, all exactly alike, a Bokanovsky group, and all, since their caste was Delta, dressed in khaki diapers. Put them down on the floor. <laughs> now turn them so they can see the flowers and books. Turned, the babies at once fell silent, then began to crawl towards those clusters of sleek colours, those shapes so gay and brilliant. From the ranks of the babies came little squeals of excitement, gurgles and twitterings of pleasure. The swiftest crawlers were already at their goal. Small hands reached out uncertainly, touched, grasped, unpetaling the roses, crumpling the illuminated pages of the books. Watch carefully, students! All right, nurses, pull the lever. <laughs> and now we proceed to rub in the lesson with a mild electric shock. That's enough. All right, take them away, nurses. Observe, henceforth books and flowers will be associated in their minds with loud, unpleasant noises and electric shock. And after 200 repetitions of the same or a similar lesson, will be wedded forever. What man has joined, nature is powerless to put asunder. They'll be safe from books and botany all their lives. But, sir, since these are lower caste children anyway and will never read... Why bother to condition them against flowers? Simple economics. If gammas, deltas, or even epsilons like flowers and nature, soon you'd see them wasting their time visiting the countryside. And of what economic use is that? A love of nature keeps no factories busy. <laughs> it was decided to abolish it, at least among the lower classes. Uh, any further questions? Uh, sir, uh, would you tell us about sleep teaching? I'm glad you asked that. The most ingenious development of all, sleep teaching is given to all our children as they grow to maturity. A little voice murmurs slogans in their ear all the night long while they sleep. Of course, it's useless for teaching, but as a method for giving post-hypnotic suggestions, it is invaluable. It's what conditions our minds to love our future role in life. Now, boys, uh, tell me some of the lessons we've all learned through sleep teaching. A gram is better than a dam. A good example. We have learned to take a gram of soma whenever we feel out of sorts. Euphoric, narcotic, pleasantly hallucinant. It transports our minds into a beautiful sleep filled with wonderful images. It gives a, a soma holiday, thus preventing unnecessary impulses such as anger, jealousy, envy, anxiety. Um, next. Uh, ending is better than mending. Good. Right. It's better to throw away something than to repair it. New clothing, new possessions, keep our factories humming, and make us happier. Next. I'm glad I'm not a gamma. Ah, yes. We're all taught in our sleep to enjoy our own caste, whatever it may be. Gammas are taught to think I'm glad I'm not an epsilon. Betas learn to be glad they're not deltas or gammas. And glad they're not alphas, because we alphas sometimes have to use our minds, and that's very painful. <laughs> <laughs> it's very good, very good indeed. Well, students, I think our tour is over for today. I'm sure most of you have dates with pneumatic young ladies. Some, of course, will be wanting to get in a game of obstacle golf. But uh, before we finish, I'd like to add a few footnotes to the things you've seen today. Today, we have a controlled society, a happy society. We have stability. Ah, there was a time when these things did not exist. Didn't people grow old and feeble in those days, sir? Indeed, they did. Old men in the bad old days used to renounce, retire, take to religion, spend their time reading, 
thinking. Thinking! Whoa. Now such is progress. At 60, we have the taste and the powers of a 17-year-old. Why, the old men have no time, no leisure from pleasure. Not a moment to sit down and think. They're much too busy scampering from feely to feely, from girl to pneumatic girl. Yeah. Fortunate boys, no pains have been spared to make your lives emotionally easy, to preserve you as far as possible from having emotions at all. Ford's in his fliver, all's well with the world. Ford's in his fliver, all's well with the world. And solemnly and devoutly, they made the sign of the tea and hurried off to join their fellow citizens at play. In spite of Fanny's dire warnings, Lenina Crown made a date that evening with the eccentric Mr. Marks, partly to show Fanny her courage and partly because she was curious. When they were safely in their helicopter and climbing above the city, she turned to him. Shall we play escalator squash or go to the feelies? Escalator squash is a waste of time. But what else is time for? All right, then, let's go to the feelies. You know, they're showing love on a bearskin rug, and everyone says it's terribly exciting. You can Lenina, actually please, feel... couldn't we just go for a walk and be alone together? But, Bernard, we'll be alone all night. Well, I... I, I meant alone for talking. Talking? Well, what about? Oh, you're beginning to feel nasty, I can tell. Take a soma, Bernard. I'd rather be myself, myself and nasty, not somebody else, however jolly. A gammon nine saves nine. Oh, for Ford's sake, be quiet. Bernard. Lenina, don't you ever want to be just you? Not enslaved by your own conditioning to be free? But I am free. I'm free to have the most wonderful time. Everybody's happy nowadays. But wouldn't you like to be free to be happy in your own way and not somebody else's? I simply don't understand you. Bernard, do you really like me? Everyone says I'm awfully pneumatic. Eventually, Bernard took Lenina to the Westminster Abbey Cabaret, where Calvin Stopes and his 16 saxophonists were playing. Also featured was London's finest scent and colour organ and all the latest synthetic music. With the aid of four Soma tablets, Bernard managed to spend a successful evening with the girl, and the next morning he agreed to apply at once for a permit to visit the Savage Reservation. He was quite nervous as he stood before the large desk of the director of hatcheries and conditioning. Oh, going to take Lenina Crown, I see. Yes, sir. Very pneumatic. Uh, uh, yes, sir. New Mexico Reservation. How long ago was it? Let me see. Twenty, twenty-five years? Hmm. I must have been your age then. Uh, sir? I had the same idea as you. Wanted to have a look at the savages. Got a permit for New Mexico and went there for my summer holiday. With my girl of the moment. She was a beta minus, I think. Oh, yes. She had yellow hair and was especially pneumatic. Well, it was terrible. We rode about on horses and all that, and, and the last day of our stay, she got lost. Somewhere in those horrid mountains. Lost. We never did find her, poor girl. Must have fallen in some crevice. Yes, we searched for days, but no luck. Ugh. Miserable trip. Oh, you must have had a terrible shock. Oh, don't imagine there was anything unethical about it. Nothing emotional or long-drawn. It was all perfectly healthy and normal. I'm sure it was, sir. What's that? Oh. Mr. Marks, I should like to take this opportunity of saying I'm not at all pleased with the reports I receive of your behavior outside working hours. Alphas are so conditioned that they do not have to be infantile in their emotional behavior, but that is all the more reason for their making a special effort to conform. And so, Mr. Marx, I give you fair warning. Uh, yes, sir. If ever I again hear of any lapse from a proper standard of infantile decorum, I shall ask for your transference to a sub-centre, preferably to Iceland. Good morning. The journey was quite uneventful. The Blue Pacific rocket lost four minutes in a tornado over Texas... 
but was able to land at Santa Fe less than 40 seconds behind schedule. Lenina and Bernard slept that night at Santa Fe, and Lenina was very happy. Imagine 60 escalator squash racket courts in the hotel and obstacle and electromagnetic golf, too. Oh, Bernard, it's simply too lovely. Uh, there will be no scent organs, television, or even hot water once we get out on the reservation. I can stand it. You'll see. Only progress is lovely, isn't it? <laughs> They took a rocket ship into the interior, and from there they traveled on horseback. And all Bernard could think about was Iceland, and how cold and barren it would be. The director's warning had made him even quieter and more sullen than usual. And then, that evening, they reached their destination. Before them was the village of Malpais, situated on a mesa. Adobe hovels growing out of the stony ground, dust and squalor, and the smell of wood smoke. What an awful place. I don't like it. Who's that man coming toward us? He used to be our guide. I I'm frightened, Bernard. Quiet. We shouldn't have come. Oh, good morrow. You're civilized, aren't you? You come from outside, from the other place? My name is Bernard Marx. This is Lenina Crown. Hmm. My name is John. Come with me. He speaks English. That's strange. Probably trained as a guide. Where is he leading us? To that hut, I believe. Uh, there seems to be some sort of activity over there. Orgy, porgy. Why, it's like our lower caste community sing. Only look. Now they're beating themselves with whips. Oh, no, Bernard. It's got something to do with their religion. What a wonderful intensity of feeling it must generate. I often think one may have missed something in not having passions like that. Nonsense. Bernard, what's wrong with that man? Where? Oh, well, he's just old, that's all. Old? But, but we don't look like that when we're old. He's so wrinkled, so... Oh, it's horrible. That's because we age all at once. We stay 17 until we're 60 or so, and, and then... And then we die, and they burn our bodies and recover the phosphorus for the good of the world state, just as it should be. But this... <gasps> what is it? That... Th that woman! Oh, Bernard, no! Take me away! Take me away! She's only nursing her baby, Lenina. That's her child. She's the mother. Bernard, how can you be so vulgar? Oh, I think I'll be sick. Please, Bernard, anywhere. Anywhere. Is something wrong? I think we'd better take Lenina uh, inside. Over here. Follow me. My Soma. I'm out of Soma. Bernard. I'm sorry, Lenina. I didn't bring him. Oh. Here. Inside. This is my home. This is my home. You are welcome to remain here. John? John? Yes, Mother. Mother? These are people from the outside, Mother. They have come to see the reservation. From the other place? You're from the other place. Don't come near me. But don't you see, I'm from there, too. I'm civilized. I don't belong here. It's, it's all a terrible mistake. This is my mother, Linda. Uh, were you born here? No. No, I tell you, I was decanted like normal people. Oh, thank Ford, someone has come. At last, thank Ford. Bernard, Bernard, please keep her away. Could you tell us about yourself, please? Well, I came here 25 years ago with a man. His name was Thomas. We went riding together on, on horses. There was a terrible storm. I got lost, lost in this horrible place. It was the last day of our stay. He left me here, alone. Lenina? <laughs> yes? Uh, you will be interested to know that our director of hatcheries and conditioning is named Thomas, and that he came here 25 no. years ago. Oh, no, no. And that... It can't be. But it is. Well, he told me so himself. <laughs> what a discovery. This boy... This boy is our director's son. <laughs> Our director is a father. Oh, it's too horrible. <laughs> Mother, what is he saying? <laughs> Iceland. Iceland, indeed. Bernard, stop it. Well, we'll see who tells who where to go now. Uh, John. Yes, sir? How would you and your mother like to return to civilization? Do you mean it? 
Oh, please, do you? Listen, they're crazy here. I was a beta minus. I always worked in the fertilizing room. I was a good worker. But how can I tell them they don't understand? They mend things. They don't know what a helicopter is or, or, or Soma. They have babies, like dogs. Oh, it's too revolting. Oh, thank God. If it hadn't been for my son, for John, what a comfort he has been to me. Your son? How can you? You were beta minus. I know, I know, but he's been a comfort to me just the same. If only I'd had Soma. Oh, do you mean it? Will you take us back to civilization? <laughs> of course. Uh, we'll leave tomorrow. <laughs> You and your son, back to civilization. And Bernard was as good as his word. That very night, he and John and his mother and Lenina took the Blue Pacific rocket to London. For Lenina, it was a happy trip since she had taken four somers the minute they got back to the hotel. For John, it was a voyage of discovery. Poor Linda, his mother, could only weep for joy. But for Bernard, it was a moment of triumph. Triumph such as he had never known before. Brave New World, Part One, by Aldous Huxley. A startling, shocking account of what can happen to our civilization 600 years in the future. And more importantly, a warning to all of us against the destruction of moral standards, family life, and the soul of man. Join us next week when we will continue with Part Two of Aldous Huxley's terrifying forecast of the future of what could become the Brave New World. Presented on the CBS Radio Workshop. The CBS Radio Workshop is produced and directed by William Frug. Brave New World was adapted for radio by Mr. Frug. Featured in the cast were Joseph Kearns, Bill Idelson, Gloria Henry, Charlotte Lawrence, Byron Kane, Sam Edwards, Jack Crucian, Vic Perrin, and Lorene Tuttle. Original music composed and conducted by Bernard Herman. This is the CBS Radio Network. Ladies and gentlemen... The distinguished author, Mr. Aldous Huxley. Brave New World is a study of the future as it may be unless we are extremely careful. It depicts a society in which man has replaced nature by science, morality by drugs, individuality by total conformity. It is a hideous prospect, yet we seem determined to follow this path of self-destruction. But Brave New World need not be our future. The choice, after all, is always in our own hands. CBS Radio, a division of the Columbia Broadcasting System and its 217 affiliated stations present the CBS Radio Workshop, radio's distinguished series dedicated to man's imagination. The Theater of the Mind. Tonight, part two of two half-hour programs devoted to one of the world's most shocking and famous novels. Aldous Huxley's terrifying forecast of the future, Brave New World. And we are proud to once again have Mr. Huxley as our narrator. Original music is composed and conducted by Bernard Herrmann. This is Aldous Huxley, 
In the garden outside the London Hatchery and Conditioning Centre, it was playtime. Naked in the warm June sunshine, six or seven hundred little boys and girls were running with shrill yells over the lawns or playing games or squatting silently in twos and threes among the flowering shrubs. And strolling across the smooth turf came the director of hatcheries and conditioning, followed eagerly by a group of new students. And here we have playtime for our little tots. Notice the games, all carefully constructed to use as many mechanical devices as possible. In olden times, children used to play simple games using only a ball and a bat. Oh, madness. Nothing was added to increase consumption. Then came our Ford. He taught us the principle of mass production in the assembly line many centuries ago and changed all that. Good morning, Director. Sir, what an unexpected pleasure. Boys, this is the resident controller for Western Europe. This is his Ford ship, Master for Mom. Boys. Good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. I was just showing the students the children, sir. Lovely children. Busy as bees at their unrestricted play. Controller, if you have the time, I wonder if you might tell the students something about the bad old days. I might. Where are you taking them? To the Hatchery and Conditioning Center to see the manufacturing of the babies. Very well, I'll walk along with you. Ah. Yes, in the old days, children lived in a place called home. A rabbit hole with suffocating intimacies. Maniacally, the mother... Uh, please don't be shocked at that word. The mother brooded over her children. Her children. Our Ford, or our Freud, as for some inscrutable reason he chose to call himself whenever he spoke of psychological matters, our Freud was the first to reveal the appalling dangers of family life. Unpleasant as they may seem, students... These are facts. People used to be viviparous, gave birth to their children. What were the consequences? A world dominated by mothers and fathers was a world full of every kind of perversion, from sadism to chastity. There were also husbands, wives, and lovers. Now everyone belongs to everyone else. Thank Ford for progress. Yes, thank, thank Ford. Ford. Actually, we still preserve a few outmoded ethics of pre-stable societies in our savage reservations. Did you ever visit a reservation, Director? Yes, I once went to look at the savages in New Mexico. Well, that must have been 25 years ago. Mother's, father's marriage. Oh, very repulsive. Yes. yes. <laughs> well, here we are. I'll say goodbye. Goodbye, controller, and thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Thank you. And now, boys, if you'll follow me inside the hatchery. And here we are, a hive of activity. Alpha's superintending, Beta's doing the skilled work, Gamma's in green, busy at routine jobs, and Delta's in khaki, incapable of doing anything except sweeping the floor. Every member of society perfectly content to belong to his predestined caste. Except for a few criminal exceptions, which reminds me, one of those criminal exceptions is meeting us here at 11. An Alpha Plus, no less, Mr. Bernard Marks. What has he done, sir? What has he done? He refuses to participate in mechanical sports. He is lax. He... Ah, here he comes now. Good morning, Director. Mr. Marks. You and Alina Crown returned from the Savage Reservation last night, I understand. Yes, sir. Uh, we visited some of the places you told me about last week, Director. In fact, uh, we science. met... Hmm? Your attention, please. Everyone step this way. If I have interrupted your labors, it is because a painful duty constrains me. This man who stands before you, this Alpha Plus, the highest level of society, has grossly betrayed the trust imposed in him. By his heretical views on sports and soma, by his scandalous refusal to be promiscuous, he has proved himself an enemy of society, a subverter, ladies and gentlemen, of all order and stability, a conspirator against civilization itself. For this reason, I am ordering his immediate transference to a sub-center of the lowest order. In Iceland, he will have small opportunity to lead others astray by his unfordly example. Bernard Marx... Can you show any reason why I should not now execute the judgment passed upon you? Yes, I can. What? 
did you say? You told me you visited the Savage Reservation 25 years ago, Director, with a young Beta Minus, I believe. Uh, you told me she was lost during a storm and that you returned without her. I thought perhaps you'd like to see her again. Linda? Thomas! Oh, Thomas! Oh, Thomas, it's me. Don't you remember? You're Linda. Oh, I knew I'd recognize you, Thomas. You look just the same. No one ages here. Thomas, look at me. I'm Linda. Remember? Hug me. Hold me. What is the meaning of this? Who is this hag? Thomas. Oh, Thomas, it's Linda. Linda, you're beta minus. John, look, it's him. It's your father. 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 What's the meaning of this disgusting joke? Who is this savage and this dreadful woman? Take them away. It isn't a joke. It's absolutely true. I'm his mother and you're the father. Father, it's me, John. I'm your son. <laughs> and now, now who is guilty of antisocial behavior, director? Oh, no. Okay. no, 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 no. A father as director of hatcheries. It was out of the question. The controller asked for his resignation. And all upper caste London was wild to see the savage and his mother. Bernard Marx became a hero, and even Lenina Crown had her share of reflected glory. Good morning, Lenina. Oh, good morning, Fanny. Well, you certainly seem pleased with yourself. Yes, I am pleased. Bernard called up half an hour ago. He has to go to a party at the controller's, and he asked me if I'd take the savage to the feelies this evening. Oh, lucky girl. What's he like, Lenina? I've heard he's terribly good-looking. Oh, he is, but so very odd. In what way? Well, the day Bernard and I left the reservation, the savage came into my room. I'd taken a soma, so I didn't notice him, until suddenly I awakened, and there he was bending over me. What happened? Well, naturally, I assumed something was going to happen. But instead of that, he just ran out of the room. Oh, how odd. What a terribly ungentlemanly thing to do. Doesn't he like you? Oh, I'm sure he does. So I can't make it out. And oh, please don't tell this to anyone, Fanny. It upsets me because I like him. I mean, I really like him. <gasps> Lenina. I know it's immoral, but I just can't help myself. I do like him. The days passed. Success went fizzily to Bernard's head. His diffidence turned to bumptiousness. His non-conformity was forgotten, and he became completely orthodox. The resident world controller appointed him official escort for the savage and asked him to make regular reports on the young man's reactions to civilization. This Bernard did assiduously. <laughs> Today I sent the savage to the feelies with Lenina Crown. The feature was three weeks in a helicopter. Instead of holding the knobs on the chair arms, thus enabling him to experience the sensations of the lovers on the screen, the savage refused to participate. Lenina tells me he called the film vulgar and indecent. The savage refuses to take Soma and seems most distressed because the woman, Linda, his uh, M-O-T-H-E-R, uh, remains permanently on Soma holiday. Uh, in spite of her senility and the extreme repulsiveness of her appearance, uh, the savage frequently goes to see her and appears much attached to her. <laughs> You mean you refuse to come down to dinner? Bernard, I'm sick. I've eaten civilization and I'm sick. Do you realize that I've invited the most important people in London tonight? The Ford Chief Justice is here. The Arch Community Song of Canterbury has flown in just to meet you. You've changed, Bernard. You used to feel the way I do about things. I talked to Helmholtz Watson. He says you've changed too. I haven't. Listen, if you don't come downstairs for my dinner party, I'll be the laughing stock of London. I'll come. Just let me read this to you first. Hmm? 
One day, many years ago, I found this book in my mother's room. One of the Indians had found it in a cave. It must be hundreds of years old. Hmm. It's called The Complete Works of William Shakespeare. Oh, I've heard of him. We don't allow it. Smut. But he says all the things I feel about Lenina. Listen to this. Hmm? Is there no pity sitting in the clouds that sees into the bottom of my grief? Oh, sweet my mother, cast me not away. Delay this marriage for a month, a week. <laughs> marriage? Oh, Ford, no. Bernard. <laughs> oh, marriage, that's too good, really. <laughs> Bernard, stop it. <laughs> and, and mother. Oh, sweet my mother. <laughs> oh, he's positively vulgar. You stop oh, wait it. Wait till I tell Helmholtz about this. <laughs> stop it or I'll hit you. <laughs> oh, come, now where's your sense of humor? Bernard. Can't you see how funny it is? Get out. I said, leave me alone. I, I, I'm leaving, John. I'm leaving. How beauteous mankind is. Oh, brave new world that has such people in it. The next morning, a pneumatic young girl, crisply clad in a beta minus viscose linen suit, stood outside the door of the savage's apartment and somewhat nervously rang the buzzer. Well, Lenina. You don't seem very glad to see me, John. Not glad? Oh, if you only knew. May I come in then? May I come? Kiss your hand, Lenina. My hand? Admired, Lenina. Indeed, the top of admiration, worth what's dearest in the world. I wanted to do something first to show I was worthy of you. What are you talking about? Lenina, tell me something. I'll do anything you tell me, anything at all. I'd sweep the floor if you wanted. But we've got vacuum cleaners here. It isn't necessary. No, of course it isn't necessary. But some kinds of baseness are nobly undergone. I, I'd like to undergo something noble, just to show you how much I love you, Lenina. Do you mean it, John? Yes, but I hadn't meant to say it, not until I... Listen, Lenina, on the reservation, people get married. Get what? For always. They make a promise to live together for always. What a disgusting idea. Answer me this question, John. Do you really like me or don't you? I love you more than anything in the world. Well, then, why on earth didn't you say so? Come here to me, John. Hug me. Oh, but, Lenina... Hug me till you <laughs> drug me, honey. Kiss me till I'm in a coma. Lenina, what are you doing? No, no, get away from me. Don't come near me. Hug me, honey. You, you... Trumpet. A dram is better than a dam. Get out! But don't you want Get me? Get out of my sight! Oh, John! Before I kill you. Oh, he's mad! He's gone mad! Oh, thou weed, who art so lovely fair and smellst so sweet that the sense aches at thee. Impudent strumpet, impudent strumpet, impudent strumpet! <laughs> Hello. Yes, this is Mr. Savage. Who's ill? Linda. My mother dying. Yes, yes, I'll come at once. Welcome to the Park Lane Hospital for the Dying. You've come to see someone in the galloping senility ward? Yes. My mother. Oh, how vulgar. You know who I mean. Linda. Oh, oh, yes. Room 43, bed 16. She'll be dying any minute now. This way, please. Is there any hope? Well, of course not. Or else she wouldn't have been sent here. Through these doors. <laughs> Oh, 
What are these children doing here? Death conditioning, of course. It starts at 18 months. Every tot spends two mornings a week in a hospital for the dying. All the best toys are kept here, and they get chocolate ice cream on death days. They learn to take dying as a matter of course. This way. Oh, here we are. Well, I must go. I've got my batch of children coming. Time for their chocolate ice cream. Linda? Linda, it's John. Your eyes are open, but you don't know me, do you? It's John, your son. Linda? Linda, don't you know me? Hug me till you drug me, honey. Kiss me till I'm in a coma. <gasps> Linda. Linda. Oh. Mother. <laughs> The menial staff of the Park Lane Hospital for the Dying consisted of 162 deltas, 84 red-headed female twins, and 78 identical mongoloid male twins. At six, when their working day was over, the two groups assembled in the vestibule of the hospital and were served their daily soma ration. It was into this crowd that the savage walked, so overcome with his grief and his remorse that he did not realize he was shouldering his way into the gathering throng. All right, here it is, Soma distribution. In good order, please. Oh, hurry up there, stand in line for your Soma. Linda. Linda died because of this. Oh, now don't grab, there's enough for everybody. One gram for an evening's delight, two for a trip to the gorgeous east, and four for a weekend in paradise. How beauteous mankind is. Oh, brave new world that has such people in it. Stop! Stop! Ford is a savage. Listen, I beg you, lend me your ears. Don't take that horrible stuff. It's poison. Mr. Savage, please, the people are waiting. You're slaves, all of you. Don't you want to be men? Don't you want freedom? Freedom? Ford Almighty, call the police. <laughs> From somewhere behind the milling, angry crowd, Bernard Marx saw the savage. He and his friend, Helmholtz Watson, had been searching for John. Now they hurried forward. Helmholtz, he's mad. They'll lynch him. Oh, Ford, help us. Ford, help those who help themselves, Bernard. Come on. Where are you going? Come back. It's a fight, a real fight. I've been waiting all my life for this. Man at last. I'll make you free whether you want to be or not. Give me those soma boxes. Sir, Mr. Savage, no! We can stop it! Helmholtz! Join me! Yes! Stop. Throw the poison pills away! By all means, throw them away! Stop it! Freedom! Be men and be free! Over here, officers, this Freedom. way! Give them the Throw them away! Freedom! Stand up as men! Win! Your freedom! Soma spray! Win! John, good. You're done. Read. Take him to the Where? resident controller's office. All right. All right, it's all over. We're all happy now. We're so happy. We all love each other, don't we? Oh, yes, we all love each other. Line up for your Soma. Soma, yes. So you don't much like civilization, Mr. Savage? No, I don't. John, you're talking to the resident controller. We don't need your comments, Mr. Marks. I think civilization is horrible. And yet people are happy. They get what they want, and they never want what they can't get. They're well off. They're safe. They're never ill. They're not afraid of death. They're blissfully ignorant of passion and old age. They're plagued with no mother or father. They've got no wives or children to feel strongly about. They're so conditioned that they practically can't help behaving as they ought to behave. <laughs> and you ask them to chuck this all away for liberty? 
My good boy. All the same, it seems quite horrible to me. Of course it does. Actual happiness always looks pretty squalid in comparison with the overcompensations for misery. And being contented has none of the glamour of a good fight against misfortune. Happiness is never grand. They call this happiness working at an embryo assembly line manufacturing babies? Science, my boy. Besides, they like it. Well, Mr. Marks, the time has come. You are being sent to an island. To, to an island? Oh, please, sir. Don't send me to Iceland. I, I promise I'll do what I should. I'll conform to the rules. One would think he was going to have his throat cut, whereas if he had the smallest sense, he'd understand his punishment is really a reward. He'll be sent to an island where he'll meet the most interesting set of men and women in the world. All the people who weren't satisfied with orthodoxy. Everyone in the world who's anyone. Then why didn't you go to an island yourself? Because, finally, I preferred this. Sometimes I regret it. Happiness is a hard master, particularly other people's happiness. Well, gentlemen, there are many islands available. Which climate do you choose, Mr. Watson? Well, I should like a thoroughly bad climate. I think I'd write better if I had to contend with difficulties. How about the Falkland Islands? That would be fine. Good. You may leave now. You too, Mr. Marks. Oh. Uh, goodbye, Helmholtz. Goodbye, Bernard. Goodbye, John. Goodbye, John. One more question. Of course. Where is God in this scheme of yours? It's a subject that has always had a great interest for me. You've never read this, of course, the Holy Bible, New and Old Testaments. I've got quite a few revolting old books like that here. But if you know about God, why don't you tell the people? Well, this book is old. It's about God hundreds of years ago, not God now. But God doesn't change. Men do, though. No, my friend. Call it the fault of civilization. God isn't compatible with machinery and scientific medicine and universal happiness. But when you're alone, it's natural to believe in God. When you're quite alone in the night, thinking about death. But people are never alone now. We make them hate solitude, and we arrange their lives so that it's almost impossible for them ever to have it. No solitude... No God. Is that why there's no self-denial here? No God? No reason for it? Of course. Industry and prosperity are only possible when there is no self-denial. If there were, the wheels would stop turning. But God's the reason for everything noble and fine and heroic. My dear young friend, civilization has absolutely no need for nobility or heroism. Your condition so that you can't help doing what you ought to do. And what you ought to do is, on the whole, so pleasant. So many of the natural impulses are allowed free play that there really aren't any temptations to resist. Anybody can be virtuous now. No temptations, no inconveniences. But I like the inconveniences. We don't. We prefer to do things comfortably. But I don't want comfort. I want God. I want poetry. I want real danger. I want freedom. I want goodness. I want sin. In fact, you're claiming the right to be unhappy. All right. I'm claiming the right to be unhappy. Not to mention the right to grow old and ugly and impotent. The right to have cancer. The right to have too little to eat. The right to live in... Constant apprehension of what may happen tomorrow, the right to be tortured by unspeakable pains of every kind. I claim them all. You're welcome. <laughs> Bernard and Helmholtz left for their islands, but the savage was not allowed to go with them. The controller wished to continue the experiment. Three weeks later, the savage ran away. After some days of wandering, he took refuge in an abandoned lighthouse. 
but his desire for solitude was not to be fulfilled. His hiding place was discovered. There were articles in the papers. Sightseers came by the thousands. One Sunday, Lenina Crown came for a picnic with three of her latest boyfriends. The day after her visit, two young reporters came to call, hoping for an exclusive interview. The door of the lighthouse was ajar. They pushed it open and walked into a shuttered twilight. Through an archway on the further side of the room, they could see the bottom of the staircase that led up to the higher floors. Just under the crown of the arch dangled a pair of feet. They called. No one answered. They saw him. At last the savage had found solitude. He was alone, quite alone. Thus concludes Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. We wish to thank Mr. Huxley for appearing on these broadcasts as our narrator. And uh, we would also like to thank you, our listeners, for your enthusiastic response to this new series. This is William Conrad inviting you to join us again next week when we present George Stewart's dramatic account of one of nature's most terrifying phenomena, Storm. The following week, listen as Dr. Frank C. Baxter interviews William Shakespeare. Presented on the CBS Radio Workshop. The CBS Radio Workshop is produced and directed by William Frug. Brave New World was adapted for radio by Mr. Frug. Featured in the cast were Joseph Kearns, Herb Butterfield, Bill Idelson, Gloria Henry, Charlotte Lawrence, Parley Bear, Dora Singleton, Jack Crucian, Vic Perrin, and Loreen Tuttle. Original music composed and conducted by Bernard Herman. America listens most to the CBS Radio Network. Parts 1 and 2 from the CBS Radio Workshop right here on the Mysterious Old Radio Listening Society podcast. And once again, I'm Eric. I'm Tim. And I'm Joshua. And we are joined by uh, the Patreon we love most, David. (laughs) David is joining us. Uh, If you missed the intro, which would be weird. I always say that because I'm an old radio guy. Nobody misses the intro to a podcast. They're like, I'm just going to join here. But David is with us. He's a Patreon, and um, we like to bring in our supporters for these guest appearances so they can pick an episode, and then um, we listen to that, and then we either tell them they were really smart or we break their hearts. (laughs) You've turned this into more of a reality show scenario (laughs) than I think we actually intended, but that's okay. David, thank you so much for being with us, and... Thank you so much for being a supporter of this podcast. Absolutely. I'm glad to be here. So, David, before we launch into a bunch of stuff, there's a lot to talk about here. But let's just start with this. When you're like, oh, good, it's my turn to join. Or maybe you didn't say, oh, good, but it's my turn to join (laughs) the Morals guys and do a guest piece with them. What do you want to do? And he said, Brave New World, Part 1 and 2, CBS Radio Workshop. Why? You know, I don't know why exactly, but I've always really liked dystopias. You know, I grew up in an area that's a bit of a like uh, a deindustrial wasteland, uh, and I used to just kind of wander around old abandoned places. And it's really, really easy to act like it's a post-apocalyptic future. Uh, <laughs> you know, you could act like you're Doctor Who, who's on Skyro, and who knows? Uh, 
make your own adventure, right? So for some reason, I've always really liked these. Uh, although technically it's not a dystopia, the author refers to it as a negative utopia. Did you listen to this before? Is it one of your favorites, or did you just choose it and say, let's see what this sounds like? This adaptation um, I had not heard before. I've read it, and uh, I've seen a couple different uh, stage versions. Uh, and the actual first one I ever saw was a, a made-for-TV movie from 1980 uh, that I saw as a kid. I think I sent a link. If anyone wants to see that, there's a, a, a version on YouTube that is not of great quality, but it exists. <laughs> it was interesting, Joshua, when you wrote the intro to this. I didn't read the intros before I listened to it or before we recorded and it was interesting because one of my first notes was, wow, CBS Workshop spared no expense getting Huxley mm -hmm. in here and Bernard Herman. And I was like, wow, this better be good because this <laughs> sounds expensive. And uh, <laughs> the thing that, uh, that struck me right away when listening to this was that the quality, the production quality is really, really good. And it's so sad that they hit on this. Because I don't know what the rest of them sound like. This is the first one I've listened to of CBS Workshop. But You might like some more than others because of your taste in story, but they are all this lavish. So sad. Like, we hit it. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, but radio's dead. I hope you like <laughs> 70s rock on FM stations, because that's what we are now. <laughs> but the first thing that struck me was, Huxley's really good as a narrator. <laughs> See, what immediately <laughs> struck me, and I laughed so hard, is the disparity between William Conrad and Huxley in those first opening lines, because he comes in with that gravelly voice, and, ladies and gentlemen, the esteemed author Aldous Huxley, and then he's like, brave new world, this is a terrifying <laughs> parable. It's like Tom Waits introducing Bilbo Baggins. <laughs> it just <laughs> made me laugh. My ass off. But um, yeah, no, he does a good job. He, he just clearly isn't a radio actor, just in that he, he has a storybook quality that really works for the production. I would hire him to read children's books, although mm -hmm. it's probably not very good at it now. <laughs> so the opening line by Huxley where he says, this takes place 600 years in the future, but if I was to tell you and write it now... I would up that doomsday clock to 200 years in the future. And I was listening to this and I wondered, I wonder if he would say today, he would say, it's about now. <laughs> now is about when it takes place. So Eric, I have a question for you. I know you aren't a big reader, but did you read this in high school? Yeah. So Because like, everyone has to. I'm glad we're, we're ripping this Band-Aid off. So yeah, <laughs> I read it in high school and forgot all of it. But don't get me wrong. I mean, I, I know the importance of it, and I know what it's about. But it was nice to hear it again and then realize that 16-year-old Eric really wasn't taking in any of these layers or <laughs> any of this stuff. And then I didn't read it, of course, for the podcast. But from my point of view, from someone who doesn't remember hardly any of it, I thought it was really smooth. I thought it was all the... I think it's a was good there. adaptation. I mean, I read this in high school. I did not like it. And then about 10 or 12 years ago, when dystopian fiction was all the rage, I read it again and went, eh, maybe I'll like it better. I did not <laughs> like it. So then when David suggested it, I went, you know what? I'm going to read it one more time in anticipation of this podcast. And guess what? I did not like it. And all that is to say that if you see me sometime in the future reading this book for a fourth time, <laughs> smack it out of my hand. <laughs> Stop me. I've given Mr. Huxley enough of my life. Just so you know, David, we asked Joshua, you know, we got to put our schedules together. And Josh's like, no, I'm busy. No, I'm busy. I'm starting to think busy because he's reading all the time. Like, how did you have time to read Brave New Workshop before we Brave New Workshop? And it's just books he hates. He just keeps on. He can't stop. Uh, but you hated the book, but did you like this adaptation uh, compared to the book or... Same hatred. No, I think this adaptation is great. Just in a nutshell, what bothers me about the book is that it was started as a parody of H.G. Wells' futuristic novels, and Huxley, for whatever reason, did not like them. But then the satire developed into something else. And I think that's kind of why it fails for me, because I think it kind of becomes the heavy-handed thing that it is making fun of. And the result is that I feel the dystopia is a little too silly to take seriously, and the satire is a little too obvious and repetitive to find funny. And I think the production here really zeroes in on what's funny, and the actors manage to really 
pull out the satire, and it's shorter. It's way less repetitive. So I really enjoyed the adaptation. I was thinking as I was listening to this and looking forward to asking you, David, because I know you do like dystopian material, uh, the question of do you think any dystopic novel or story has a satirical element inherently? Because I also, the, the satire jumped out at me that seemed at sometimes at odds with the sort of critique of this dire warning that's also sometimes pretty silly. <laughs> I don't know. That's a really good question. Um, you know, I think 1984 is hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the funny thing is, that this is always compared to 1984, but, you know, you have to remember that, that this was put out before the Second World War. So the horrible direction that he thought society was going uh, is a completely new set of horrors after the Second World War for 1984 to talk about, right? Uh, Huxley b- must have had some real kind of eye-opening moments throughout the next 50 years or so of his life after this and, and of what horrors there are. Uh, because Actually, th- it's interesting. He wrote a letter to Orwell after the book came out saying he liked it a lot, but he thought his prediction was more accurate. <laughs> so he stuck to his guns on his dystopia. I mean, that was a good plan because um, to me, it's it's more in line with what has happened, whereas Orwell's was very much, I don't think he was trying to say this is going to happen and this is the future. I think he was trying to say, look out for this stuff. This is bad stuff that we should know about as a society. I mean, Huxley as well was kind of thinking that this is bad stuff, but from a completely different mindset. Huxley was from a, a very well-established, wealthy family. And to me, in many ways, his worries were the worries of of like a, a lord in, in Britain, right? And, and someone who uh, is part of the aristocracy. And they're like, oh, look at how crass the world is becoming. That's the ter- most terrible thing I could think of is, is a crass society. Orwell uh, just had bigger enemies. <laughs> uh, as I was looking at these, there's sort of three things to talk about in my head. One is the ideas. One is the story itself. And one is the actual production elements. And I, I agreed with what Eric was saying earlier. The production elements are so sharp and, and so compelling. I will parenthetically say in the opening sequence with the uh, the students, when their footsteps, kind of their, their murmurs, eh, it's funny. I don't know if you meant to be that funny with the murmurs. <laughs> mm, forward, forward, oh, mm, forward. Um, I think they did, honestly, based on the sound effects. Because I thought you were going to talk about their footsteps. And I think yes, it's intentionally comical. The scurrying <laughs> footsteps each time he points out something new. It's like, oh, oh, steppity, 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 steppity. <laughs> oh. And I-, I thought that was really effective. Um, but to finish my thought, there was the technical elements, the ideas, and the story itself. And strangely, it's the ideas that go into it, which are probably the thing that is most known for, were the least interesting to me. For many of the same reasons you were saying, that this is kind of armchair speculation that occasionally has some really striking ideas to debate about, like, the value of conditioning someone. Is that always inherently bad? Or is there times when that's actually useful? And the satirical parts, like the vulgarity of family, that's funny, but it doesn't really argue well uh, against the terrible truths of this awful future. Uh, but the story itself I found pretty interesting of who I thought was going to be the protagonist turns out to be a pretty craven little uh, fame hunter who turns on mm-hmm. his ideals pretty quickly. I don't know if this is a thing when people discuss Brave New World, so forgive me, but to me it strikes me that the main character and the uh, <laughs> Mr. Savage, the son, that <laughs> it's a great debate on who is worse. The Puritan Protestant values that Mr. Savage has aren't much... Uh, better than the world as it stands right now. I think the extremes of it are both not great. And so I'm wondering, is that a point of the book? Yeah, and I think that's intentional. That's why I think he calls it an an anti-utopia, because there should be elements that we as listeners in this case feel like that wouldn't be so bad to not age until you hit the age of 60. But I think what gets lost in this a little bit until the very end, this particular adaptation, is this idea that these people have no choice. It's not so much a choice between uh, what John represents and what the dystopian or anti-utopian ideals are, but the fact that there is no ability for anyone to choose not just either one of these, but anything in between in the entire spectrum. And it's interesting, there's a flaw to me in the sense that if there is no choice, then why are they so freely allowed to visit this place in New Mexico? 
Like you would think that they would be like shutting that down. Only high ranking people, right, who have been very, very kind of controlled. One of the uh, big names that is not um, mentioned as much in this adaptation as in the book, but uh, Sigmund Freud was a bit all the rage because uh, they were extending a lot of his arguments about conditioning. And at the time, it was felt that, oh, actually, conditioning is a good thing because you have anxiety or you have whatever and you're trying to work through your problems. And then he just took it to the next level of like, well, when does that become control? Uh, And I think that what he was trying to say, and maybe the reason you didn't like it as a book, is because the characters do all kind of suck and it's because their society sucks. And that's, again, uh, somewhat Freudian that that your society has an influence on the individuals. And if you have a society that is structured in a way uh, where people are terrible, then that will work. And very often it's difficult to get into stories if you don't like the people in it, right? Mm -hmm. It worked for me and exactly what you're saying uh, because – I kept hitting the characters like, okay, this is my point of view character. This is the guy I root for. And then, nope, I don't root for that guy. This guy, nope, not root for that guy. But it didn't play out in such a way that I I hate all these people uh, as much as I just kept discovering that almost my own biases of, I think this guy is a good person because of XXX, by which I mean the porn. (laughs) No, that's not what I mean at all. But um, (laughs) I think this guy is a good person because I'm conditioned to read books that way. And then find out, nope, there's no one in here I should have rooted for, and maybe I should have seen that sooner. Yeah, in 1984, you know, there are people who you really like, and the things that happen to them are even more tragic. And this one, you know, honestly, you get to the end, and you're like, oh, that's too bad. You know what's interesting about this as a radio play from someone, let's pretend I didn't even hear about Brave New World, and I did forget most of it. This really plays out as a really nice piece of radio drama sci-fi. If you just listen to it as as that, as like, hey, this is X minus one and we wrote this story, (laughs) you'd go, that was pretty good. That was a pretty cool story. That was pretty nice. Can we talk about the production uh, elements for a second here? Particularly that opening sound effect of the test tube assembly line. I found on uh, the Digital Deli a very excellent old time radio site, an excerpt describing everything that went into that sound effect, which was a metronome, tom-tom beats, bubbling water, an air hose, a cow moo, a boing, an oscillator, dripping water, and three kinds of wine glasses clinking together. But when he brought it to the producer director, they went, "Mm, I don't think it works. So then he played it all backwards and added an echo. And then they were like, gold. Wow. Uh, I think that it's also fascinating that everything you described, I'm like, yep, I know what that is. I know what this is. I'm not 100% sure what a boing is. <laughs> like, I know the sound of a boing. <laughs> but got a boing over here? Boing. It's a noun. It's a thing that makes a boing. <laughs> like how a cow is called, sometimes called a moo. Right. You could sell a lot of stuff if you just called it brand new, boing. Get your boing. Uh, I don't know how much by design it was, but it was a really fascinating two-part split. The first half, I was actually kind of tenuous about the show just based on the first half because it is so expositional up to a point, but it invests a lot of time in setting up this world. And then by the time you get to the second half, it's off to the races. True. Like the first half is all exposition up to the moment he meets John and Linda and realizes who they are. And it's the first moment that suggests that there is some sort of actual story to be had in this world instead of merely a description of it. I think the description of the world is highly entertaining, so it didn't bother me that much, but you're absolutely right. Uh, This also contains the sound effect of somebody patting somebody's Mm -hmm. butt. It's actual (laughs) butt patting Foley, which just (laughs) amused me to no end. It's the moment when um, the director talks to, I forget her name, um, and he's like, charming, charming, pat, 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 pat. I could find no quotes as to how they achieved that Foley, unfortunately. (laughs) Back then, you were just allowed to pat him on the butt and put a microphone near it. (laughs) I I bet it was probably a pillow or a balloon full of jello. I don't know. (laughs) There were radio Foley specialists who would bring their butts in. (laughs) <laughs> you had to have the right tone to your butt. <laughs> Thanks for being our guest, David. <laughs> <laughs> now you know all the stuff we edit out, David. <laughs> yeah, well, I was told I have a butt for radio, and now I know what it means. <laughs> and with that tagline, now we can't edit that out. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. I was surprised by the amount of sex that stayed in the radio adaptation. Honestly, I was assuming more would be removed. Um, it's not as explicit as the book, and they cut some things that are very uncomfortable, but kudos to them. One of the flaws I have with the story itself is about the sex, and I know I make everybody uncomfortable, but in general, <laughs> I think it's difficult to see a future of humans where you've convinced them that sex for procreation is not going to happen anymore. I would find that nearly impossible, I think, to drive out of humans to have babies. Yeah, and one of the things the book spends a lot of time on arguably too much time on is all all the various methods they have to release all these tensions. They have something I can't remember called a, like a false pregnancy or something along those lines. They have I'm blanking on it all. But yeah, there's a lot of time spent on that. Oh, I was just gonna say, yes, in the book, they talk about like, there's a series of drugs and they're gonna you you'll have all the different experiences and all the things that you need to have as far as adrenaline rushes uh, of the life you would normally be be living. Uh, but yeah, it's a bunch of conditioning. This theory that the, the family would kind of dissolve was kind of just very in vogue at the time, too. Mm -hmm. I will do just about anything if someone had invents Soma for real. That sounds delightful. <laughs> Medicinal, you know. I love that it sounded like Roma, because all I could think of is that. <laughs> That's S-O-M-A, Soma. <laughs> Wouldn't a gram full feel pleasant right now as you listen to babies being electrocuted? <laughs> Which is my other favorite part of this. <laughs> the idea of using Soma as rye control, like, not not shabby. That's... Oh, the Soma spray? <laughs> yes. Okay. That was a clever I... idea. Just everyone instantly gets happy. <laughs> but I do want to talk about the uh, baby electrocution scene. Uh, because somehow that is hilarious. <laughs> Maybe it's just me. I rewound it like three times. Because <laughs> it's just this a bizarre series of like cartoonish sound effects. And I think it was intentional because you've got the cooing babies so happy looking at the flowers, then gunshots and wails and then electricity sound and sobs. And it's... I had the same reaction, Joshua. Oh my God, why am I laughing? Oh my God, <laughs> I'm still laughing. It was a horrifying yet... I couldn't help but picture it. You remember electric football, the little guys on the on the board that would go, and they'd just move around the board? That's what they look like to me across the room. <laughs> moving around the room. That was horrible. You're both monsters. <laughs> no, I think that's very intentional on the part of this production. It's one of the things I admired about it because that's the only way you could do this, right? You had to take it to a comic level or else no one would listen to a really <laughs> realistic depiction of babies getting a, even right. mild electric shocks, as they say. It's like when you bring it to the level? producer, they're going to like electrocuting babies. Is it going to be funny or how are we going to do this? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, how else besides funny? Yeah, that's. <laughs> Comedy gold. <laughs> there are a few moments in here, and Tim brought one up about conditioning. There are a few moments in the novel, in the story, in the, the prediction that I find myself going, well, that's not so bad, or I actually somewhat agree with that. And one of those moments was the quote of, the secret of happiness is liking what you have to do. I know that's a slogan of theirs, and that we're supposed to go, ooh, that's bad, but I went... Actually, I put a lot of stock into that idea. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's the genius of this book, I think, is because that is true. It's really good. What's bad is if a all-powerful state genetically engineers you to enjoy what you have to do. I mean, because because one's a philosophical thing that we can all get behind. <laughs> the other is terrible. By the way, Joshua and Tim, just so you know, I have copious notes uh, that aren't for the podcast from this. For our next uh, theatrical show that we are going to write together and put on stage called Three Hours in a Helicopter. <laughs> we are. <laughs> I looked it up and nobody has done that movie based on that <laughs> suggestion. I've got to see Three Hours in a Helicopter done somewhere. <laughs> Well, I just assumed every film they talked about was porn, so uh, Three Hours in a Helicopter, I assumed, was. And it is. In the book, it's just much more explicit. It's people in a helicopter. Uh, Going at much. it. <laughs> <laughs> 20 minutes in a helicopter. 
Also, I would like someone to invent the game of obstacle golf so I can see exactly what's going on. <laughs> or escalator squash. I would love to see these actually put into play and... You can't tell me that that wouldn't be a highly rated show. There is something so British about the humor in here. It made me think, like, I would love to see an adaptation of this by, like, P.G. Woodhouse. I can see, like, right. <laughs> you know, Bertie Wooster playing obstacle golf in a Jeeves and Wooster novel would be hilarious. Uh, while we're picking out little things like this, the compliment to Paige Woman of being pneumatic is, like, just every time it landed, I was like, ow. Oh, that's, ah. <laughs> uh. I was having a difficult time with that word. What does it mean in this novel to be pneumatic? Pneumatic is a device that uses pressurized air to make it function. But I mean, I think the intentional. (laughs) Yes, it has that quality to it, too. But I think it's also, besides just a dirty joke, it's that intentional mirroring of the dispassionate mechanical world in a sexual superlative form. Yeah, I think... it was a term that was that was newish, right? Because it, it is based on well, society adopting Ford's Industrial Revolution on a large societal basis of of creating everything, right, uh, as if it was a in a factory. And so I think that that was just a word that he threw in there, thinking that it would just have a certain sound and a certain kind of picture that would go in your mind. But yeah, I looked it up too after I read it. I was like, is this mean what I think it means? And it, yeah. Yeah, there's also a slang dictionary term for pneumatic that means, and here we go. You can cut it if you want, Joshua, but it means a woman with large breasts who is good at jumping up and down on a bed. Who's not good at jumping up and down on a bed? (laughs) That's exactly what I was going to (laughs) say. I would say that at this point in my life, at this age, I'm probably terrible at it. The fact that it takes me 20 minutes to get out of the bed every morning... Uh, any final uh, thoughts, uh, words of wisdoms, weird of note things? Um, one thing that I think is successfully creepy in here, even though a lot of it is comic, is uh, the moment in the hospital for the dying when John goes to see his mom, Linda, and she mirrors the Hug Me Till You Drug Me song that um, the woman had serenaded him with earlier. It's a really just creepy, sad moment, and it's really effective, I think. A lot of great Foley. I love Bernard Herrmann's score. It's this really strange, cartoonish minimalism that reminds me of Raymond Scott, if you're familiar with him, the guy who they used all the music for in the Looney Tunes cartoon. Powerhouse. Um, and, yeah. And, 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 and he and, actually and, made an album in the early 60s called Soothing Sounds for Babies, <laughs> which it has more electronica in it, but it sounds a lot like Bernard Herrmann's soundtrack here. So I thoroughly enjoyed it. Was it a lot of sound effects of electrical shocking? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Music to like cute of... babies by. Yeah. One thing uh, I would like to point out would be uh, at the end when the main character is at the, the lighthouse, right? And uh, he's basically driven to kill himself. In the in the book, there is more of a media presence, and it's he's being hounded by the media and by groupies and people who who are just kind of like think he's hilarious and are in his face and that is just another element i thought was very not dissimilar to the world that we have kind of created for ourselves right to me that that was the interesting thing about this is i think in some ways you could you could read this story today and kind of be like oh you know it's it's not that terrifying or anything but i think that shows how much of it actually came to pass and how much of the of the stuff is just like oh, just modern oh that's just ordinary stuff you know and that's kind of what's terrifying about it is it doesn't scare us cuz we accept it you know mass consumerism on a global scale the sort of cultural enslavement to pornography the widespread abuse of prescription drugs to <laughs> find happiness and we're like eh whatever you don't know much, Huxley, but yeah, it's because we're just totally used to it. Well, and at the time, you know, as I mentioned before, it was written, it's more of a product of the Great Depression. And so there was a feeling that, you know, if people just consumed more, there'd be more jobs because you need people to make the things you'd consume. Uh, and so that's why that underlying thing is about mass consumption without the thought of all the garbage you make. Mm-hmm. It wasn't connected to that yet. No, not yet. I is sitting here thinking that perhaps I may have been shocked as a baby while looking at books. <laughs> <laughs> that might explain it. It really explains a lot. Oh, we should send this to the vote. Okay, Tim. 
it's a mixed bag to call a classic because the series is well, having only heard the one, but it just certainly seems like this is an amazing series. It doesn't get enough attention. It really stands up. I mean, this is excellent production and excellent soup to nuts. So it certainly stands the test of time. The story itself is a weird blend of shocking and compelling ideas that really resonate with, with modern times and some ideas that are so hilariously outdated that they may have been meant as satire or they may have been repurposed as satire in this production. And as we were saying, the actual story, the characters are kind of hard to root for. You don't necessarily invest as much as you would, say, in 1984. So it certainly stands the test of time. I don't think I would call it a classic. I will say that analyzing it only as a piece of uh, radio drama and not paying any attention to the book at all or if it's a good adaptation of it or what the book really means, I found myself listening to a piece of sci-fi old-time radio that was expertly produced, directed, and performed, and I found it compelling and riveting, and I, since I had forgotten most of Brave New World, <laughs> I didn't know what was going to happen next, and I found it very X-1-y, and I mm-hmm. know, and, and I loved it, and I will say that not only does it stand the test of time, but I find it to be classic-esque in the sense that you could play this for anybody. And other than what Tim's and we've all brought up, is there some outdated notions of things in the future? But I really enjoyed it. So, yeah, that's where I go with it. Classic E. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to save David for last since he's the guest and say that I think this is a rare adaptation that, to me, successfully improves upon the original because it takes at least one strain of Huxley's intent and really clarifies it. And so that's why it doesn't bother me that we don't care too much for any of the characters because in an hour-long radio drama, it just plays like a dark comedy. It's like a dystopian episode of The Office. <laughs> just <laughs> <laughs> laughing at this absurdity and these poorly behaved people. I don't know that it's a classic as a standalone. I think it cut so much that um, part of me wonders if you might get a little confused if you aren't somewhat familiar with the novel. But again, it's hard for me to separate because I've read it three times. (laughs) Yeah, it didn't confuse me, so I've got to be that litmus test, aren't I? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I think the things that seem far-fetched, like I said, are because we've surpassed them. Not because they they didn't happen. I mean, that we are actually (laughs) living them. And the the trappings he puts on them seem silly. Um, But he he definitely predicted things more accurately than some of the other dystopian folks. I just think I would have preferred a list of his predictions than a 280-page novel. (laughs) But uh, this definitely, (laughs) definitely... Uh, stands the test of time, and it's of historical interest being like one of the last big-budget hurrahs from the golden age of radio in the form of a CBS radio workshop. David! Yes. You know, it's interesting because everything is, of course, a product of its time, uh, and the original book being a product of its time had a number of things that, that didn't make as much sense. And the recording being a product of its time where – they society had progressed enough that they knew a number of the different things would look cartoonish and that they could lean into the comedy aspect. So I think that the, this is I think this is a classic for its time. I feel like you could redo this and you could make the whole thing hilarious if you wanted to. I mean, nothing is as funny as the electrocuting babies, of course, but you could like <laughs> try for it. So, yeah, classic. Awesome. All right, David, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, Tim, tell them stuff. Please go visit ghoulishdelights.com, home of this podcast. We have a lot of other episodes there. Um, feel free to take a look around. Go sequentially. Look for your favorite episodes, for your favorite series, however you want to do it. There's many more episodes. Um, you can also find links to our social media pages there if you want to tweet at us or Instagram things or, you know, Instagram at us. You could Facebook <laughs> at us. Uh, God. YouTube at us. <laughs> You could TikTok-y. You, you no, know, you can't tiktok you're just here. You're making don't... up <laughs> words like Huxley. <laughs> orgy, porgy at us. <laughs> well, you know. I am now going to get the rights to that app. <laughs> orgy, porgy is a good app. See all our pneumatic photos. 
All right. <laughs> I think I'll wrap that up. <laughs> you can also be like David. He is a role Yay. model. You can go to patreon.com slash the morals and support this podcast. Who knows? You might even end up a guest. Um, yeah, it, we have all sorts of great benefits, uh, don't we, David? Oh, yeah. Yeah, clothing. <laughs> clothing. <laughs> All of our Patreon <laughs> supporters are fully clothed. <laughs> uh, you can also go to iTunes and write a review. Uh, we appreciate those as well. Just thank you for supporting us in any way you can. And if you'd like to see us do our theater versions of old-time radio that we used to do on stage, but here in January of 2021, we are still not back on stage, we do them online with our theatrical partner, Park Square Theater in St. Paul, Minnesota. We do original work and recreations of old-time radio uh, live on stage or as they are now online. But just go to parksquaretheater.org to see us perform old-time radio uh, original and adaptations of classic work. Parksquaretheater.org. You can also find out everything you need to know about us by going to ghoulishdelights.com or mysteriousoldradiolisteningsociety.com. Once again, David, thank you so much for being yeah, here, you. sir. You bet. Anytime. Anytime. Good. Well, we'll see you tomorrow. And, uh, <laughs> Joshua, what's coming up next? Uh, next, we have another one of our mysterious patrons. Uh, Kelly will be joining us for a listen to The Nightman from Suspense. Until then... Look out! Huxley, get in here. I love your work. Good book. Uh, I need you to boil this down to bullet points for me, see? <laughs> <laughs>